Okay, so we were working with our um, RMP curve, and we have you know kind of these basic changes that are brought about by the Federal Reserve, and we do feel that the Federal Reserve sets the target interest rate. Um, so they're effectively kind of the body that, that changes this MP function. There are a couple of other elements to the interest rate that we need to address, and uh, and the Federal Reserve does. I will say they do take these into account. Um, as, as part of their target interest rate. So it still kind of comes down to that it's the Federal Reserve that's changing the MP function. But, um, but our textbook kind of writes it out almost as like a, well, they, they do write it out as a math equation. Um, so, so I think we should look at it that way in terms of the math behind an MP change. And it's, it's really pretty easy. Like I said, the Federal Reserve still takes these uh, variables into account. Uh, but that's okay, we'll kind of break it down. So if you recall earlier this semester, we had an equation for the real interest rate. We said R was equal to N uh, minus pi, um, right? The real interest rate was equal to the nominal interest rate minus the inflation rate. Um, we wanna actually kind of add to this just a little bit. And the textbook gives us a couple of other variables that, that we should look at. Um, and again, remember that whenever we are working in the money market, we have to really, truly kind of put aside our easy way of thinking of it. You know, the easy way of saying, hey, money demand is just spending and um, GDP. And, and kind of go on the idea that remember, it truly is the theory of liquidity preference. And the theory of liquidity preference says that people prefer to hold money as cash at low interest rates and prefer to save at high interest rates. We actually have to account for that in this interest rate. And so the textbook gives us a variable. They call it TSE, uh, which stands for term structure effect. So that's kind of a formal way that the normal, like everyone else would just call it a term premium. I don't know how to spell premium. Eh, close enough. They would call it a term premium. Um, so that's kind of what we want to look at. So let me give us a definition first here. TSE, or the term premium, or formally the term structure effect, is the additional interest that investors require in order to be willing to buy a long-term bond rather than a short-term bond. Oh, that'd be better. Uh, so, we, we actually kind of talked about this very briefly when I put the, uh, when I went and I looked up the bond prices and remember I said that there, I, now I don't remember them of course, but um, I think it was the three year bond was at like 1.1 1 .1 and the, or no, I'm sorry, it was the 10 year one that was at 1.1 .1 and the 30 year one was at 1.7 or something like that. The idea is, is that, that people don't like not having access to their money for a long time. And if I'm going to lock my money into something, you know, if I'm going to lock it into a long term, I can't get cash for this, you need to make it worth my while. And, um, and uh, that's kind of what the idea behind this term premium is, is that, you know, if you're not going to have access to your money for 30 years, you need to get more out of it in return. Um, and so that's what the kind of the TSE is. So it effectively says we've got to add this to whatever interest rate you're receiving. Or I, I need to revise it so I could show R is equal to N minus pi plus TSE. So that's a, kind of one element that the, the book kind of adds to this. The other element that they add to this is called the default premium. I'm just gonna go up here now. The, the default premium, which we abbreviate 
dp. This one I think that we kind of all um, have kind of heard about, know about, etc. Um, but I'm going to still kind of give us a quick definition for it. The default premium is the amount added to the interest rate to account for the risk that a borrower will fail to make required payments. The default premium is an amount added to the interest rate to account for the risk that a borrower will fail to make their payments. So effectively, um, while we have TSE that is from the investor's perspective, it's, uh, it's effectively accounting for investor risk. What if, um, what if I could do something with my cash that would be better in 30 years? DP is accounting for bank risk. Um, what if over the course of a time period, someone um, doesn't pay on their loan? The bank wants to add a value into an interest rate to account for their risk as well. Um, which again, I think we all kind of, that's something that we kind of just generally know in society, that if there's higher risk on loans, banks are gonna assess a higher interest rate. That's where that DP kind of comes into play. Um, we need to account for that in part of our interest rate as well. So I want to rewrite my formula for R is R equals N minus inflation plus TSE plus DP. This becomes our formal kind of starred, if you will, um, mathematical representation of the interest rate. Um, and it's this value as a numeric amount that is really shown on that MP function. So it's this calculation that is shown right here. Um, now again, like I said, the Federal Reserve kind of tracks it. They have a really neat way of tracking this. They track uh, just the deviation between the two, um, between different years uh, of of terms and that difference between the two is the term premium. So the Federal Reserve actually accounts for all of this, um, but it, do, it does change kind of like, again, some of those model shifting effects. Um, so let's hypothetically, let's just make up some values here. Let's say that um, the nominal interest rate is five, uh, the inflation rate is three, um, TSE is two, and the default premium is one. Just, again, arbitrary, made up here. I can solve out R by saying five minus three plus two plus one, and I would get R equal to uh, two, four, five, right? R equals five. So that gives me this value here. What if something changes? What if, I don't know, what if TSE is not two, it goes to six, right? Just arbitrary made up here. Well, I could solve it out, keep everything else the same, I would have Five minus three is two, two plus six is eight, plus one is nine, and I would get an R equal to nine. Well, nine is higher up on the axis, so R2 would be up here, which brings my MP function up. Again, the Federal Reserve does account for this, though, so it's kind of, a, it, it's kind of an added thing the book does, but it does give us another way of looking at change in this model. If any of the variables in this equation change, we can solve out a number. So right, if any of them change, if I say TSE goes up and you wanna make numbers up and then make TSE higher the second time, yeah, you can solve what it does. The inflation rate falls, solve out all the numbers again. You can just make numbers up and it gives you an indication of another methodology for seeing that MP function uh, shift and, and change. So, um, so again, still generally, I think it's pretty simple because it's just kind of matching in the formula. Um, we're not gonna take the math for this any further than that, uh, but it does give us that other shift methodology.